Uh, I'm Laird Klingler, a librarian with the uh, Cornish Historical Society. Um, we're here at the home of uh, Henry Hellmeyer, um, site of the uh, former uh, Cornish Creamery. Uh, Corey Fitch will be doing the filming. Uh, the date is October 12th, uh, 2019. And before we start on the, uh, the, the personal interview, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the creamery. This is um, an important site in Cornish in relation to the agricultural history you know, of the town. Um, there were three creameries you know, in Cornish. Um, this is the Cornish Creamery you know, in the flat. Um, there was the Hillside Creamery opposite the Cornish Windsor Bridge. And there was another creamery, the Clover Leaf Creamery in, in Mill Village. But um, we're here at, at the what well, was the Cornish Creamery. So let me um, <clears throat> ask Henry to speak a little bit about, you know, about his home in relation to what was the Creamery. Yes, I'm Henry Holmeyer. I bought this house in August of 1970. That's 49 years ago. And I've lived here ever since, uh, with the exception of a few years I spent in uh, West Africa with the Peace Corps. I bought the house in 1970 from Harold Wilson, Wilson spelled with two L's, and he had had it since 1953. He had it as a summer home, and uh, it was quite the funky place. When it went up for sale, I looked at it, and I'll have to admit that I had a hard time seeing how it could be turned into a year-round house. There was no insulation, there were no storm windows, there was no furnace, there was just very basic plumbing and septic. Uh, it had been a house that had after the creamery went out of business, and I'm not sure what year that is. Laird thinks it was 1918. I'd heard dates as late as 1924 or 25, but Laird probably knows better than I. Um, it had been lived in by poor people, essentially, who had wood stoves and, and temporary chimneys. Uh, when I moved in, there was a kerosene stove, which is what we used for heat that first fall. At the same time, uh, I took down a number of the old chimneys and cleaned the bricks. I was a school teacher. I was the teaching principal in Plainfield, New Hampshire. I taught third grade and part-time principal. Every day after school, I'd come home and I'd clean a hundred bricks with a hammer and chisel, take the old mortar off, knock them loose. And uh, on the Saturday uh, each week, I had two plumbers from Windsor, Henry Elaine and his friend Frank, and they would I would mix the mud and carry the bricks and they would build a chimney and a fireplace. It's a double flue chimney so that I could have a, fur a proper furnace. But that chimney didn't go through the, through the roof until December 8th or 9th. And believe me, we had some cold times before that. Mm -hmm. But it was a grand old place. Uh, if you look at a picture of the uh, creamery, you'll see that there was uh, a big loading platform, which Mr. Wilson had enclosed with a window that he bought in uh, Northampton, Mass. Came out of the Northampton Inn, a big piece of glass that he put in there and fit just right. Uh, there were two other, so that was now a window, but there were two doors you see in the picture of the creamery. On the left-hand side was the wood loading door double wooden doors, which uh, allowed wood to be tossed into the steam boiler, which uh, ran the machinery in the creamery. On the right-hand side was a door coming through an open porch, which allowed farmers to go in and sit down and wait their turn to be paid by the paymaster for the uh, milk that they delivered. They would then drive their wagon around the south end of the house and in the back, they would uh, collect uh, buttermilk that, uh, that they would take home to slop their pigs. And uh, I still have a, a zinc plate that's about this size that went around it, around the pipe that came out of the building. Apparently there were strips of metal that you would get, depending on how much milk you brought, you'd get a long, if you brought a lot of milk, you'd get a longer strip than, a, than if you brought a little bit of milk. You'd push it in and it would automatically dispense five, 10, 20 gallons of buttermilk to take home. The wagons that would then continue along the east side of the creamery, which is the back side as you stand on the road, and up a little lane, which would bring you back on a creamery road. And it's my understanding that Route 120, 
which which bypasses the creamery now, um, was in fact the main road was right in front of the house, and then that got straightened out probably sometime in the 1930s. Uh, because it's a post and beam building, I was able to manipulate the interior walls and remove interior walls uh, so that I could make it more livable. Uh, the windows have all been replaced now. The big picture window, which is on the east side, was not there. So it was quite dark in here and there was no glass on the north side of the building. Uh, as you look at the north side of the building now, there is a deck with a six foot uh, deck doors, which brings in a lot of light. And um, to the right side of that, another big window, again, to let in more light. Uh, in 1982, when I was back from Africa, um, I met and married uh, a woman who had two children. And the upstairs of the creamery was just a loft at that time. It was a storage area. Um, but to accommodate Phil and Josh Younger, um, we did a 34-foot shed dormer. We raised the roof, put in two bedrooms, a bath, and a laundry upstairs and some storage areas. So what had been a factory now had two bedrooms upstairs and more. So that was nice. And um, I've done much of the work myself in terms of uh, fixing up this place, learned how to, how to build walls and so forth. And yeah. it's, it's been a good adventure. Do talk about the, the uh, up here. Yes, uh, the, the main machinery of the creamery is still in place, hanging from the ceiling. There's a 30 foot long steel shaft that's about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half in diameter with uh, flywheels on it. Those flywheels were connected by leather or cloth belts to machinery. And that whole uh, drive shaft would rotate, uh, having gotten power from a steam engine. Which was? Which was over here oh. in the, where the spiral staircase is now in the entrance to the house. Mm -hmm. Um, when I bought the place, the brick in that area was chin high on me. If I stood on this level, that was all brick. You couldn't enter the house from that direction. And that was what I said every day after school. I, I knocked loose 100 bricks and, and cleaned <laughs> off the mortar. Yeah. Uh, I used 2,000 bricks to build that fireplace, hearth, and uh, chimney. So... Uh, there were cream separators and butter churns that were on this main work floor. And they were, again, the, the, they were driven by some kind of a belt off the, uh, the, the long drive shaft. You know, I think it's important to stress, and you could comment on this too, um, the change that this brought to the production of butter and cream, you know, in Cornish. Uh, in the past, this was done manually you know, in people's homes, um, and it's quite intensive labor uh, aspect to it. It was done primarily by the, by the women of the family, you know. So this was a way to expand the production. Yes, yes. and not only that, uh, this coincided with the development of the railroad because the uh, butter went to Boston largely. Metropolitan Boston was a big market for butter. And... Uh, before the railroad, there wasn't there was no way to get butter down there. So once there was a transportation system, then there could be a manufacturing system, and uh, this was it. My my understanding was that um, uh, as expansion took place at a later time, what bigger factories were involved, mm -hmm. and the, the local creameries really went out of business. They couldn't handle the volume, for example, that a big factory could you know, in churning, in the churning process, but good. Well, um, as I said, this is, a, this is a significant site, you know, you know, in Cornish for the agricultural history. Um, can we move now to a, our personal interview? Sure. You know, with you. Um, may, may we start with uh, where and when you were born? I was born in Boston in 1946. 46. Tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up. My dad was a chemical engineer and uh, we moved around a lot. Uh, but mainly in uh, Massachusetts. We lived in Nashua, New Hampshire for a while. And then when I was in the first grade, we went to Connecticut, we lived in Milford, and then settled down in Woodbridge, Connecticut, just outside New Haven. And uh, after, we bought a house. And after 
two or three years, my dad was getting anxious to go on to, to greener pastures and, and I was looking at a job in New Jersey. And my sister, who was three years older than me, said, Mom, Dad, you can move to New Jersey, but I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> she just dug her heels in and said that she would live with the neighbors and that uh, she was not going to move. And they, she was in the sixth grade and had been to eight different elementary schools. And she just said, I'm, I'm tired of moving. As soon as I make friends, we have to move. And I was younger and hadn't really made much difference where we were when I was preschool. And then, you know, we settled in when I was in the third grade in Woodbridge. So we never moved again. My parents lived there till they died. You didn't go to New Jersey? No, we did not. Oh, oh. And, um, and then I, I fell in love with this part of the world when I went to Dartmouth and, and learned to love the I was going to ask you about your education. Yes. Right. Yeah. Now, I graduated from Dartmouth in 1968, and uh, I loved this part of the world and the, the cold winters and skiing and hiking and the, the White Mountains and so forth. So uh, when I graduated, the Vietnam War was on, and I had been accepted in graduate school uh, for a master's in social work and a uh, at social work and uh, elementary school guidance counseling, but... Uh, my draft board told me that I wouldn't be able to go to graduate school, that I would be drafted if I did. So uh, I got a job teaching school in Jersey City, New Jersey. So I did get to New Jersey, oh, Okay, uh, yeah. but it was at a different time. And I taught in a ghetto school, inner city for two years, uh, but was considered a troublemaker because I lived in the neighborhood and, and was friends with Black Panthers and had Black Panthers come and help me in the classroom. and. And uh, I did lots of things that most teachers didn't do. And, and so I wasn't sure about a third year teaching down there, but I had a friend in the education system uh, in the Upper Valley. And I came up here for an interview when the, the job of third grade teacher and principal was open in Plainfield. Plainfield? And, yes. What's now Bill Smith's auction gallery was my school. Really? A five-room really? schoolhouse. By the way, I assume from what you're saying that you were opposed to the war in Vietnam? Yes. Yes. And uh, uh, my wife, Gretchen, uh, taught in the same school. She taught first grade, and, and we bought the creamery. We found it was cheaper to buy the creamery than it was to rent a farmhouse in the countryside. So we lived here for two years, teaching and working in Plainfield. And then my sister, Ruthann Mitchell, uh, was living in Cameroon in West Africa and invited us to come visit. And uh, we said, well, that would be interesting. And uh, Gretchen said, why don't we take a year and see the whole world? We'll hitchhike around the world in a year. And we were both travelers and, and hitchhikers. And mm. she had traveled around Europe. I had traveled around the States, rode freight trains and hitchhiked all through the United States back in, in summer of 68, 69. And uh, we got married in 70, moved here in 1970. And, um, so we decided to go and see the world and ended up joining the Peace Corps in Cameroon and mm. uh, doing other... You and your wife. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, after a few short uh, consultancies, uh, I went to Mali in West Africa, to Bamako, Mali, where I was director of the Peace Corps program for almost five years. And Gretchen was doing a PhD at Columbia in New York City. And... Uh, we eventually parted ways, but uh, I came back here in 82, having been gone to a full 10 years, from 72 to 82. Mm. I came back and moved into the creamery and started fixing it up some more. Mm -hmm. And what came next uh, for your occupation then? Well, uh, I wanted to be a writer, and I had written a children's book, which I thought was pretty darn good, but I had no idea how to get a book published, and I was not successful at first. It took me 40 years, actually, to, <laughs> to get the book published. Wobar and the Quest for the Magic Calumet. Yes, yes. Uh, finally did get published by Bunker Hill Publishing many years later. But uh, uh, I didn't know how to make a living at first. You know, I was used to being a Peace Corps country director. It was a big, important job. And uh, I, I took, uh, I worked on the town road crew for a while with Harold Morse. Did you? Yeah, yeah, one winter. And I, I, uh, I was director of the Listen Center in Lebanon for a year, for nine months. Oh. 
and I hated that. The more, way too much administrative work, and and there was a lot of bickering and with the board of directors and the staff and so forth. So I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I sat down trying to figure out what was the best approach. And I said, I'm going to learn a trade. So I went started going to night school at Claremont Votech, and I got my uh, apprentice. Uh, I was an apprentice electrician, and then I got my journeyman's license and my master's license. I started my own business. So I was an electrician for 14 years. And But the main thing that I always did was garden. I loved to garden. And um, towards the end of my career as an electrician, I said, you know, I could be designing gardens and installing gardens for people. It would be a lot more fun. And I think I could still make a living doing it. Not as much money as being an electrician, perhaps, but I could make a living. So I mentioned to a couple of my electrical customers that uh, I was thinking about starting a gardening business. They said, oh, start here. (laughs) So I did. And I uh, I put my name out there and people hired me to design and install gardens and maintain gardens. That was a lot of fun. And I would do gardening in the summer and electrical in the in the winter and Ultimately, I started writing a, a gardening column for the Valley News. You're the gardening guy. Yes, and I did that for 17 and a half years. Um, after, let's see, in 1999, uh, I, I spent the winter going around and visiting newspapers in New Hampshire and Vermont and introducing my gardening column to editors and saying, wouldn't you like to run it? And uh, I got... S- four or five newspapers that first winter that signed on as for my weekly column along with the Valley News. And then I got a lucky break. I got to meet somebody who works for the New York Times and um, she put in a good word for me. Ann Raver, who used to write uh, gardening columns for the New York Times, put in a good word with her editor and said, you'll have to make it on your own, but I'll at least get you in the door. So I started writing for the New York Times on an occasional basis. And that... uh, that opened doors for me to all the small newspapers of New England because I'd call somebody up and they'd say, are you the same Henry Holmeyer I read yesterday in the Times? <laughs> I always tried to call on a Monday, particularly if I <laughs> yeah. had an article in. And i say, yes, oh, we couldn't afford you. And I said, well, tell me what you could afford. And I never turned down an offer. Even if it was only $25 for a column, I'd say, okay, we can do that. And then I knew that if, if I got my foot in the door that I could then probably convinced them to increase my pay with time. And, and, uh, and at one point, I had up to 16 newspapers who were ca- carrying my column every week. Presently, we read you in the Eagle Times. That's right. Yes. And I'm mm-hmm. also online at uh, herecast.us, which is a blog site in White River Junction. And I write not only my weekly column there, but sometimes extra columns, extra information midweek during the summer in particular. Mm-hmm. So you do basically um, uh, writings and then um, you, you do consulting yes. you know, you know, for gardening. Right. I'm not doing much hands-on gardening for anybody. I'm 73 and I don't have a, a need to go out there and pull weeds for people. But um, this past year, Cindy Heath, my partner, and I did design and install a Japanese garden out in um, Eastman that was oh. very, very satisfying. Um, We did a lot of research. We had a a customer who was very good to us and allowed us as much time as we needed to to put it all together and to do the research during the winter. And and she's very, very pleased with it. So that's been great fun. Good. And that involved a lot of hands-on things. And I've always enjoyed pruning fruit trees. So I've been doing that uh, all these years. I I had one client in, in Norwich that allowed me to prune her apple tree for 20 straight years. And boy, that's a beautiful tree. <laughs> Unfortunately, she's passed on, so I'm, yeah. I've lost touch with the tree. But you know, I'd like to uh, uh, change now to uh, uh, your activities. You know, in Cornish, and I wanted to start with the uh, recognition that um, you were the founder uh, and creator of our neighbor to neighbor group. That's right. This came from you. You know, you you started this, and um, you know, we have continued. You know, yes, you know, I know, like and you, you've been wonderful at taking over the parts of the of the job that I didn't like, which was all the emails and calls and, <laughs> and that sort of thing. Right. But uh, but the yeah. other things that you've done in Cornish too, tell us about that. Well, I was very active in the uh, in the Cornish Fair for many years. Uh, I took over running the vegetable and flower divisions for a long time, and then I dropped the flowers and let the garden club handle that. And uh, I ran the vegetable 
contests in the gym every year for many years. And then I said, well, it's getting, it's getting too much. There's a lot of paperwork involved. One year you recruited me to help there. Right? Yes, I that. I absolutely. That. Yes. yes. Uh, and so I dropped the adult section and just did the kids' vegetables. And one of the things I enjoyed was introducing some new ideas. I, uh, I introduced the idea of humorous vegetable uh, category. Uh, largest vegetable category. So the kids could grow a really big zucchini and get get a decent prize for it. You know, it's $10 for the first prize for the biggest zucchini, $8 for second, and five for third. That's good money for a kid. But I also said, I want every little kid that enters to be able to at least get some kind of a ribbon, you know, a third place or a recognition of some sort. And that was really wonderful because that really, kids were more excited about getting a, a third place or, or participation ribbon than getting a dollar or two. Uh, you know, the, the, the prizes for the ordinary categories are not very much. It's like three, two, and one dollar. But uh, the kids really enjoyed that. And I introduced the Scarecrow as a contest on the, on the stage. And that's been so much fun. People really enjoy seeing good Scarecrows on the, on the stage. But I had learned that idea from, from Tunbridge. And the neighbor to neighbor, I had learned about uh, because the, pe- the guys up in Lyme did that. The kids, the Lyme idea? Yeah. yeah. And um, mm-hmm. one of the things that, you know, about going back to neighbor to neighbor, I felt that, that at the time there were very few opportunities for men to get together and talk. You know, we, we see each other at the post office or at the store. We say, hi, how you doing? Women seem to have little groups that they meet and they do things and they go places. I wanted to have a chance where we could sit down and um, have a high caffeine, high cholesterol breakfast somewhere <laughs> and uh, and talk to each other, not only about what we can do to help the less fortunate in, in, um, in Cornish, which is really the goal of Neighbor to Neighbor, uh, to help people who are struggling with some aspect of life, whether it's a ride to the hospital or getting their roof shoveled or some... some um, firewood carried in or delivered. Uh, there are lots of little activities that we can do that make us feel good and help make this a better community. And I like that idea, but it wasn't my original idea. It was something I'd heard about the, the, the Lyme people, guys yes. had done. Yeah. And then, of course, we then branched it out under your watch, uh, inviting women to join and, and be members of it. And, and I think that's a grand uh change and, and uh, improvement good good um also now you you but you were active in the garden club too yes for many yeah. years i ran the garden club and yeah. you know i i I'm, I'm less active in the garden i'm not active in the garden club at present there are just so many things one can do in the course of a week and i have to make decisions cindy and i like to travel and uh we do that we try to get away and see different parts of the world and different parts of the country and visit friends here and there. Um, you know, I'd like, um, especially with you, who has been here 50 years, um, looking at past and present. And before we get to Cornish past and present, where did you do your shopping, for example? Where would you go to shop? 50 years ago? Yes. Claremont. Claremont. Friday night, <laughs> we'd go down to Claremont and we would... Um, get our groceries and we'd go to Village Pizza and get pizza. <laughs> and they're still there selling pizzas, though I don't get down to Claremont nearly as much anymore, but that's where you could, you know, buy a pair of blue jeans at uh, a little uh, uh, family store in, right on uh, Pleasant Street. And that's where the insurance company was that insured the creamery and everything was in Claremont at the time. People talk about how active it would have been on a Friday night. Yeah, it was very busy. Yeah. Did you ever go to the movies there? Oh, absolutely. There was a movie right on, on Pleasant Street, yeah. you know, what yeah. I think of as Main Street. And, uh, yes. Nancy Whiteman has, has said that there was a drive-in theater out on Washington. I don't know whether you ever, ever went to it. Did, did not go to the theater there, no. Yeah. Now, looking at Cornish, um, you know, past and present, whenever I ask this question, two elements come up. One would be the changes in the roads, mm-hmm. for example. And the other would be the changes in terms of declining school enrollment. Let's start first with the roads. Now, you are on a state, just off a state road. Right. What, what are your reactions for the road situation in Cornish? Roads have always been good. I have no complaints about the roads. And uh, East Road uh, 
used to be quite a problem during the mud season because Sullivan's had their dairy farm there and the, the milk trucks had to go through no matter what. They had to get the big tankers or medium, small size tankers, I guess, uh, to get up there every other day and get the milk. So that hill would get chewed up and, and uh, deep with mud. But in general, no, the roads have always been well taken care of. And of course, Harold Morris was road agent for 25 years. He yeah. got elected every year for 25 <laughs> times yeah. in a row. Yeah. And he was a great person. He, yeah. he was uh, generous and kind and thoughtful. It was a real pleasure for me to ride shotgun in his truck when I was working on the road crew. Sometimes we'd just cruise the roads looking to see if there were any uh, places that needed attention. And he would stop in and, and visit with the elderly to make sure that everybody was all right. He'd say, Henry, you stay in the truck. I'm going to go and check in on Mrs. So-and-so. And he'd, uh, he'd go in. He'd leave, it was the middle of winter. He'd leave the truck running, keep it warm. And he'd go in five or ten minutes later. And he'd, if he, if he needed to bring some groceries or uh, something for that person, he'd uh, do it the next day. And he was a kind gentleman. Right. Now let's uh, talk now about the uh, the other issue with the school system and, and the declining enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see as the reason for the declining enrollment in the schools? Well, we're an aging community, and. Uh, People with children uh, can't necessarily afford the price of a nice house in Cornish as easily, you know, home prices have, have multiplied many times. I won't tell you exactly what I bought this house for, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's assessed at 20 times what I paid for it. So that's gone up in 50 years quite a bit. And taxes are fairly high. So people are living out in places like Canaan and Orange and and, and, and more out in the periphery and then commuting into Hanover, Lebanon, where the work is. You know, uh, some people have felt that um, our land use policies have uh, helped to develop this situation of a declining enrollment in the sense that uh, we're not encouraging younger families, you know, to move to move in. Um, we all want to preserve the uh, rural character, you know, of the town. And we want to do everything we can to help agriculture, you know. But pe some people have said that, for example, um, five acre zoning mm -hmm. is a limitation uh, in terms of developing affordable homes. Um, other people um, have said current use does not operate to the benefit of everyone in the community. Steve Taylor has said that this is a property tax transfer. Mm -hmm. You don't think so. Um, you have views on land use in Cornish, and some people have said also there could be areas in the flat. There's one acre zoning in the flat. Mm -hmm. um, some people said we could have areas where, where more clustered development, you know, smaller homes. Any views on that, Henry? That you know? It's not something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, but as you as you describe it now, it would make sense to have areas uh, where we had one acre zoning. Of course, if you have a bigger school population, then you have more school teachers and you have higher taxes. So it, it has to, there has to be a balance in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, current use does allow large parcels of land to stay undeveloped, which is nice in terms of keeping the rural character of the town. We don't want to look like West Lebanon here uh, or even Hanover. So it's it's... Not something that I've, I've, I've really focused on. I see. I see. Well, it is a complex issue, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, here in town. Um, um, whether there's a contradiction between land use and, and the, or, or is land use related to the decline of school enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, well, 50 years here, um, I, I, I think you've had a good life. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Cornish yeah. has been very nice to me. Yeah, and yeah. I've certainly enjoyed living here. And but you've made contributions to the town, you know. And, so. and I'm a master gardener, and I've, I've, mm -hmm. oh, I'm always well, willing and able to help people with gardening questions. If as, as they come up, people email me and ask me questions or call me up. So you've helped me. You've helped me. You know, so, yeah. Uh, um, I think we're finished almost with the, basically what I wanted to Let add. me just turn this off. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I finished with the, uh, the questions that I wanted to ask um, before we end. Is there anything else you would like to add? Uh, mm -hmm. 
That's a good question. I'm, I'm just uh, thinking about that. Uh, I guess one of the things that I do think about is the whole climate change issues. And, uh, you know, people like Greta Thunberg, uh, this young Norwegian woman who is, uh, has been very active in the world in terms of making people think about how we how we live our lives. And I think living in a town like Cornish, we can be very careful to protect the environment, but we have to think of things like our wood burning stoves and how much uh, emission, how many, you know, what, what quantity of emissions come from our stoves. This is something I've got a, a nice soapstone stove that was state of the art back in 1982 or three when I bought it. But, uh, I'm wondering now whether I need to look at something with a catalytic converter it is more efficient. I know that this one was rated as being very eco-friendly back in 82, but I, I suspect the technology is, <laughs> yeah. is a bit different. I think if you burn it clean, it helps. But uh, again, it's something I'm thinking about. Uh, but we can all do our, our part in terms of how much electricity we use when we go to the post office do we idle our cars or do we turn it off? I read something once that said, if you're going to run your car for more than 10 seconds, you should turn it off, you know, rather than leaving it idling while you go in the post office. So I very simply put my post office key on my car keys. So I have to take them out of ignition <laughs> and there's no choice of leaving the car running and going sure, in to get my sure. mail because I'm going to be there more than 10 seconds. Good, good. And I think that if all of us think of the little things we can do, how much hot water do we use? Uh, and and yeah. every, every bit of it is important. And, and um, I think the young people of today, and not just Greta, but I think there are many of the young people who are thinking about what it's going to be like when they're my age and, and what's, the, what's the United States going to be like or what's the world going to be like. Yes. Yeah. No, well said, well said. Thank you. Well, I think uh, that's it. And, uh, you know, Corey, uh, at, at the end of, uh, of every interview, uh, we always say, well, that's a take. <laughs> Thank you.